media friends, and welcome to The World Transformed. My name is Phil Bowermaster, and with me in the virtual studio is my co-host, Stephen Gordon. Hello, Stephen. Hey, Phil. How are you? Well, I am super fantastic. How are you, my friend? Man, I'm doing great. We've got a great week going here. It's a little bit off because of the holiday, but not entirely off. We're doing a regular World Transform show on Monday and a regular World Transform show on Friday. And sometime during the week, we've got a new Fast Forward coming out. We're going to be talking with Dave Schrader about sports analytics. So we're doing a couple of high-tech concepts, and then we're doing kind of a money ball show. So it's kind of a, I don't know, kind of a mixed bag week. Lots of, lots of great stuff going on. Awesome. So today's show is, uh, is gold from thin air, and we're, we're not talking actual gold, uh, AU gold, not, not that. We're talking metaphorically gold, right? Yeah. It, what's interesting here is you hear a title like gold from thin air, you think, well, that must be purely metaphorical. Only the gold is metaphorical, because we are talking about bringing something extremely valuable right out of the air. And you're right, it's not actually gold. It's something potentially more valuable than gold, and that is high-quality carbon nanotube, which a process has been discovered and is being developed by which they can be manufactured directly from carbon dioxide in the air. This new process potentially dramatically cuts the cost of creating these structures and the technological, socioeconomic, financial benefits of this are really kind of hard to state. I suppose we should go back and just briefly talk about what carbon nanotubes are, shouldn't we? Yeah, carbon nanotubes are a diamondoid material. And when I say diamondoid, diamonds, the reason that they are the way they are, and they're translucent so you can see through them, and they're, but they're very, very hard, is the way the carbon nanotubes are lined up. Uh, excuse me, the way the carbon is lined up in, in a lattice framework. Well, carbon nanotubes have a similar structure but they're hollow, like straw, but they are as strong as steel, m- much lighter. They're conductive to electricity, so they could be used in electronics. You know, there, there are even proposals, uh, Phil, to use carbon nanotubes to create a space elevator, and we've talked about that many times on the show. It, they're the miracle material of the future, and we've had carbon nanotubes since, I would guess, the early 2000s. They've been able to isolate them, but the quality of the nanotubes, uh, how tightly they are bundled, and the length of them has always been the problem. And apparently this method of actually get, taking the carbon out of the air is producing higher quality carbon nanotubes than they've ever had before and potentially solving a problem that we've got with the atmosphere, right? Too much carbon. There's just a lot to unpack here, that's for sure. Right, there's, a, there's, right. a, there's an awful lot going on in this story. And to your point, carbon nanotubes, we've, they were discovered a while back. We've known about them for a while. They fit in to the overall broad field of nanotechnology, although you can have a lot of cool stuff going on with carbon nanotubes without actually having machines working down at the na- nano level. What's interesting about them is their structure at the at the nano level as you as you pointed out that this is a super material these are a material that will allow us to do things that we've not been able to do before what things well some of them we've been talking about we i think for as long as we've been talking about the space elevator we've been mentioning carbon nanotubes right yeah it's one of the only material that uh has the theoretical strength when we say theoretical strength. We've never seen carbon nanotubes as strong as they would need to be for the space elevator because we've never had the high quality carbon nanotubes that we we think we can one day have. And obviously the idea has never been anywhere near remotely near tested, clearly. Right. Uh, Of course not. And so, but carbon nanotubes have the theoretical strength and no other material does. No other material even has the theoretical strength necessary to build a space elevator. So whenever we mention space elevators, it's, it, well, how's it coming with the carbon nanotubes? You know, well, uh, you know, they're coming along. And, you know, they can, you know. and so year after year, we, we, keep, we continue to bring it up. And there's always something to be said about the state of the art with carbon nanotubes. They're, they're the higher quality. We're, we're getting longer carbon nanotubes, which is essential, too, obviously. Uh, but, um, you know, this, is, this one is a pretty important story. This is an important milestone to be able to pull it out of the air. The space elevator is a great example because Arthur C. Clarke and I think a couple other people around the same time first gave us the idea of the space elevator back in the 60s. I think it's probably the origin of that idea. Maybe some 
really far-looking science fiction writer came up with something similar even earlier than that. But we know that in the 60s, Arthur C. Clarke was writing science fiction about the idea of a space elevator. Called it the Beanstalk or something, I believe. Yeah, something like that. And even even in those days, you had to speculate a material being developed which could be used for it because it was known then that nothing that we had would work. Nothing that we had would be strong enough to hold a tether on one end of the earth and... He called the fictional material in his stories fictionite, or, fictionite, or at least, there you he, go. yeah, and because he knew that there, there's nothing on earth that can do what I needed to do to be, you know, be strong enough. He could see, he knew what was required, but didn't have it. So, turns out the carbon nanotubes is fictionite. Uh, Fiction, fictionite come true. He could, he could foresee that eventually we would be able to develop something that might work. And right. sure enough, in the early 2000s, we discovered carbon nanotubes, and we said, okay, well, this is pushing us right, definitely in the right direction, and this may indeed be fictionite. And I think that's a good case in point for what good are these things. They're, they are an almost magical substance. They're going to open up all kinds of possibilities. There's possibilities around computing. There's possibilities around medicine. There's possibilities around engineering, megastructures, but also day-to-day structures, right? Everything you own that's made of stuff potentially has a carbon nanotube application, right? If you can imagine a more durable, a more more electrically conductive, lighter, uh, wear, wearable electronics yes. that also have you know that also have to be bulletproof. How would you like to have a shirt that uh, provides you with augmented reality, Phil, and uh, also protects you from bullets, right? Uh, it, you know, so you know. I know you're not dodging a whole lot of bullets in your day-to-day life, but you know, you never know. You just never know. You never know when it's <laughs> going to come up. And uh, better That's to right. have it, and not need it, is what I always say about the, <laughs> exactly the Batman exactly. suit, basically. So, so now, over time, since they were discovered, we've been figuring out ways to make them. They're complicated structures in, in terms of the processes required to to get them. And up to this point, the cost of manufacturing them has been prohibitive in terms of actually producing enough of them. The name gives it away, nanotubes. These are small little things. To be able to produce enough of them to do anything with has been a problem. The other problem has been what we're able to manufacture at the macro level using traditional manufacturing technologies has been kind of disappointing. It's like, well, these are carbon nanotubes, but they're not great. They're on the low end of what you would look for in terms of carbon nanotubes. Well, what we've got here is researchers at Vanderbilt University who have figured out a way to extract carbon dioxide from the air, take the carbon from carbon dioxide in the air, produce carbon nanotubes, and the ones they're getting are the good ones. Okay? The, the, this interesting piece over here on Kurzweil.com, it says, the price ranges from 100 to $200 per kilogram of the economy class carbon nanotubes with larger diameters and poorer properties, up to 100,000 per kilogram and above for the first-class carbon nanotubes, the ones with the single wall, the smallest diameters. And that's what they're getting from this new process. So, and they've got in quotes here on the story in Kurzweil, the most valuable material ever sold. Okay? So yeah. if you can imagine, $100,000 per kilogram is a lot pricier than gold. These things, they leave gold in the dust in terms of what they're worth. What we're looking at here, Phil, is something like the economy of the demand for it. Because it's a little bit like when uh, Napoleon had that state dinner and, you know, he, he was served with gold forks and utensils and things like that. And you know, most most of the people had silver, uh, you know, silverware and were, mm-hmm. you know, were served with silver. But the guest of honor, the person who uh, they wanted to honor the most, had aluminum. Right. Uh, uh, utensils because it was so valuable and rare to be able to have aluminum. I, I think what we're looking at when they when we say this is like uh, this is more valuable than gold is because right now it's not very uh, we don't we don't have much of it. But if we could develop this process where it really would change the world, where we have so much of it that we can we can do uh, do all these amazing things with it, then it'll become uh, like aluminum, right? I mean, uh, we'll have carbon nanotubes everywhere. It no longer would be more valuable than gold, except that it has changed the world, and so in some ways it still is. Aluminum does more good in the world than, than gold does, right? But it's, it's still per ounce, uh, gold still beats it by far. So that, That's, anyway. that's exact, exactly right. Once we figured out how to make uh, – there's a, there's a lot more aluminum around, but you have to extract it. it it's, it's, right. 
it's not aluminum metal on its own. So you, we needed a good process for extracting it. And then suddenly it's this extremely useful stuff that shows up everywhere. You know, it's the wrapper for right. chewing gum, right? I mean, it's in, it's in everything all the time. Not a precious metal, but a commodity. It's actually the kind of transition that we're looking for cryptocurrencies to go through eventually, right? Where people aren't buying them because they're going to get rich because holding them is super value, but it becomes this everyday day-to-day used kind of thing. That's what that's that's the transition that aluminum went through. That's yeah, the transition. When, when that, I can go to a vending machine and buy a Pepsi with Bitcoin, that, that's when it gets real to me, right? And the can uh, is made of carbon nanotubes, okay? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it stays super cold. That is like a super cold Pepsi, and like 10 hours later, it's still super cold, right, because of the carbon <laughs> nanotechnology. Uh, exactly. So, somehow it's refrigerated. Uh, the, the technology can. used in the used in the can. Uh, we've got another link here, understanding nano, uh, because we don't have time to go into all the wonderful potential applications for carbon nanotubes. Just look at a few of them. Some of the sensors that will be enabled, some of the communication technology, some of the computing applications. Look in healthcare in terms of researchers. I just want to read one snatch here. Researchers have demonstrated artificial muscles composed of yarn woven with carbon nanotubes and filled with wax. Tests have shown that artificial muscles can lift weights that are 200 times heavier than natural muscles of the same size. So people who potentially have uh, muscular dystrophy or have lost use of their muscles might get a replacement that makes them a lot better. They've got applications of carbon nanotubes taking out tumors. There are incredible potential applications across the board. Anywhere that materials are used, there is a potential cool carbon nanotube use for that. So it's the fact that they are so broadly applicable that they can bring improvements to so many different areas that will have super fuel efficient vehicles that carbon nanotubes may be the thing that actually makes hydrogen a viable fuel for cars. There's, there's, there are just so many areas that you look at it and go, well, there's another thing that we could, we could do with them. And here's another thing we could do with them. The problem has been getting our hands on even a few to start making even some prototypes of some of these technologies. At $100,000 a a kilogram, you're looking at a very, very pricey proposition even to do basic research. Well, what they're doing, extracting from the air, driving the cost down in terms of producing the high quality carbon nanotubes, this can open up research in carbon nanotubes and it can really begin to create markets for some of these products. So we actually could begin to see that transition occur where if they can be had plentifully, if they can be taken straight from the air, and suddenly you've got good ones on your hands and you're free to experiment, the price begins to go down. Eventually the price plummets and they become a commodity the way aluminum is. And suddenly we're living in a world where almost everything we touch is touched by carbon nanotubes. Like plastic is everywhere. Aluminum is everywhere. Carbon nanotubes will be everywhere, even inside our bodies. I, I could see uh, b- bones being laced with the stuff. And imagine the value of having a skull that has carbon nanotubes uh, embedded in it to make your skull just, stronger, just, right? And you, just think of what it might do for dentistry, okay? Just dentistry yeah. alone is, uh, you know, <laughs> not, not only no, were your no, teeth... No cavities there, right? So, uh, your teeth will be impermeable. And probably they'll have computers in them, too, thanks to the carbon nanotubes. So it'll be just amazing stuff going on there. So we've created this whole new economy. We're pulling carbon dioxide from the air. And as you pointed out, Stephen, wonderfully, that's reducing our carbon footprint on the planet. It's actually pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. Our fears of climate change potentially allayed here, right? I mean, because one of the big things we've talked about is you don't fix the amount of carbon in the atmosphere by cutting carbon emissions. All you do is you stop how much more you're putting in. This would actually pull carbon out of the atmosphere. And if you get a big enough gold rush going, and if carbon nanotubes became as big as plastic, you might pull a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere. In fact, and this is the potential downside here, you might pull so much carbon out of the atmosphere that you do the opposite of the feared climate change of global warming and... Who knows? Kick off an ice age. What do you think? Is that a possible scenario? Could something like that happen? I think it would be easily alle- alleviated. So if there's one thing we're good at, Phil, it's putting carbon into the atmosphere. So I think if we were, if we were pulling out too much, uh, we, we, we could make adjustments. I think that's probably true, too. What, what, if anything, if we start pulling carbon out of the atmosphere at a truly prodigious rate, it would, if, if anything, just create a new market for technologies that 
add carbon back into the atmosphere, of, which are abundant, right? We, we, which we don't right. have to invent. All we got to do is we all start burning coal in our fireplaces, right? I mean, it's, it's an easy problem to fix. That would be an easy problem to fix. So I think the the upside is a whole new economy, whole new bodies, whole new computers, energy, space elevators. All of it enabled a bright future. Potential downside: we kick off an ice age, but we'll we'll, we'll just have to be careful and we can probably avoid that. All right, and with that, that's the good news on carbon nanotubes. So catch us later this week with a Fast Forward show, and on Friday uh, we'll be back talking about lasers, right? We're going to come back and talk about lasers, so look forward to having you all with us then, and until next time, live to see it. Mm-hmm.